I am going to speak about this repeated temperature logs of uh, our deep borehole in Czechia, borehole Litoměřice. Borehole is located in this part of Czech Republic, uh, close to town Litoměřice. On this map of heat flow of Czechia, you can see that uh, borehole is situated in area with increased uh, heat flow above 70 milliwatts per square meter. Ah, oh, sorry. And so the borehole uh, was the borehole was repeatedly locked. Uh, but uh, I mentioned uh, the depth of the borehole 2.1 kilometer, but the probe was able to go only to uh, to one uh, 1700 to 1800 meters. And uh, as you can see, the borehole was drilled in 2007, and uh, the consecutive locks uh, reveal the typical behavior. It means it it, it, it is borehole is cooling in the upper part and warming in the lower part below approximately one, one kilometer. Uh, as you can see from these last two uh, locks done 11 and 13 years after the end of the drilling, uh, the, these two locks are practically identical and they, we believe they are close to, to equilibrium, equilibrium temperature. Sorry, uh, maybe uh, now it is right. So <laughs> I would like to notice you uh, two uh, features at the lower end of the borehole and in the upper upper end uh, on the next slide. So this is detail of the lower end of the borehole and you can see uh, linear cores, but uh, quite a varying uh, gradient in this section below 1600 meters. There were some discussions what, what is the cause, but in the end it turned out that the reason was uh, uh, inner steel tubing that was perforated uh, in this section. So it probably induced some convection and after removal uh, this inner tubing, uh, the last uh, uh, logging done in 2020, the temperature was nearly linear in this section. Uh, another interesting feature is this upper part uh, where you can see evident temporal changes of temperature and uh, three consecutive logs done in 2015, 18 and 20 show uh, gradual downward migration of this minimum uh, downward and we believe it is, it is, uh, it is related to recent warming which can be demonstrated on this slide. This is a history of uh, mean annual ground surface temperature at, at the mountain station, some 15 kilometers away from the borehole. And uh, no, I would like, sorry. You can see this uh, enormous warming in the last 40 years. So the difference in decadal means between, let's say, beginning of 80s and the present time is two degrees. So it's quite robust and it is so. <coughs> so then we calculated from the latest temperature log, we calculated gradient. Uh, so uh, the, borehole was, uh, the borehole was drilled by rotary drilling and only uh, several meters of, uh, of coring was done below sediments. So uh, all this uh, lithology and shown stratigraphy is based on rock chips. Uh, so the stratigraphy is uh, well, some 200 meters of Cretaceous sediments, then uh, to 800 meters approximately permocarboniferous sediments. Then there is very interesting layer of volcanic rock, rhyolite, igrimbrite, and then there is quite homogeneous proterozoic mica schist layer that goes from 900 meters down to the bottom. Uh. Uh, as you can see, the gradient in sedimentary section varies a lot. 
it is uh, given by uh, different lithologies on the individual strata and also in the upper, uppermost part by this uh, recent uh, climatic changes and probably in this Cretaceous layer also by groundwater movement. But in the lower part, in this homogeneous mica schist, you can see quite smooth, slow increase of gradient with depths. The difference between this upper part and lower part in gradient is several Kelvin per kilometer. So we start to do some, uh, some ge geothermal interpretation of, of these measurements. So we constructed, we constructed uh, a thermal conductivity model, uh, heat production model, thermal conductivity model, uh, conductivity was measured in this volcanic rock and in the mica schist, but it was only estimated according to abundance of the individual rock types and their typical uh, conductivities in, in sediments. Uh, heat production was uh, also measured in this uh, very high uh, productive, heat productive uh, volcanic rock and in, in mica schist and it was estimated in sediments a typical value of two microwatts per cubic meter. So uh, as you can see, the calculated uh, gradient varies a lot in, in um, sedimentary layer and uh, this conductivity multiplied by gradient produce this heat, heat flow. So the heat flow varies a lot within this uh, sedimentary layer uh, from less than uh, 60 milliwatts per square meter to 80 without any depth strength, whereas below sediments the measured heat flow gradually increases from some 70 to 85 uh, milliwatts per square meter. Uh, maybe I should, uh, I should uh, say something about this increase of uh, measured heat flow. So because the mica schist is quite homogeneous and it can be assumed reasonably that its conductivity is more or less constant with only slow decrease due to uh, temperature dependence of thermal conductivity. Uh, for us, one of the most uh, probable explanations of this temperature increase with depths was that it is a climatic signal of the last glacial cycle, glacial interglacial cycles. Uh, to to demonstrate the effect of such, uh, such of this glacial cycle on subsurface temperatures, uh, I used uh, such history of the last one million year uh, that is assumed to be typical for Central Europe and calculated synthetic response. It is shown here. So for that uniform uh, changing of uh, ice and inter glacial si sites times and interglacial it is this curve this is temperature gradient so these are profiles of temperature gradient and uh, the, this green line it uh, considered also some warming by two kelvins four kilo years ago that uh, represent the uh, end of uh, holocene warming so uh, as you can see uh, heat uh, gradient increase in this layer covered by that uh, lock in mica schist in our borehole also increases by several kelvins between this upper and lower end. So again, uh, it was for us uh, reason why we tried to uh, interpret this increase of gradient and heat flow in our borehole as a climatic, climatic signal. Uh, so we solved the inversion problem. We use this functional space inversion that uh, considers, uh, that is based on Bayesian approach and considers input data, namely conductivity and measured uh, temperature as a random uh, values that can be changed in, 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 in the run of, of the inversion. And our confidence in the input data is expressed by this standard deviations of, in this case of conductivity, at that layer below 900 meters. <coughs> so for different values of the standard a priori, standard deviation, we got such history, it is logarithmic scale. So uh, for 
low values of standard deviation, we have uh, very similar uh, curves with the minimum somewhere during uh, last glacial maximum and rapid increase in, in Holocene. <coughs> Whereas for uh, high values of standard deviation, a priori standard deviation, we have such uh, mod modest, modest uh, uh, change of uh, temperature. <coughs> the reason for that, for such a different results of this inversion, are shown here. For uh, small standard deviations, the inversion has no space uh, to uh, change uh, uh, the initial conductivity profile, so it interprets the measured uh, temperature as a, really as a climatic signal, whereas for high standard deviations of uh, conductivity, it has a freedom to explain uh, the increase of gradient with depth as a decrease of conductivity with depth. But because we believe in uh, homogeneous uh, mica schist and more or less constant conductivity, we adhere in our interpretation uh, to this, uh, let's say, to this standard deviation, this small standard deviation that provides a posteriori temperature, pro uh, not temperature, conductivity profile like this, so very close to the original estimate. Uh, so, we in, in the we, so we believe in this in this family of, of curves, let's say, for this, this standard deviation. Uh, so, when I use the history shown at, on the previous slide by the red curve and calculated the direct problem by solving transient heat conduction equation with, with the original conductivity heat production, I got this heat flow curve. So, contrary to the measured one, we can observe such uh, increase of heat flow uh, with depths. But it means, uh, it means that the uh, conductivity model is quite wrong in sediments. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, this, condu this conductivity above eight, 900 meters, so conductivity from the section that was not used in, in the inversion. This section cannot be used in inversion because it is, uh, because it is not possible to separate reliably uh, steady state and transient part of temperature in this, in this section when you have poor knowledge of, of conductivity. But uh, if we had right profile of conductivity, we should observe the same heat flow as that produced by uh, this uh, solution of this direct problem. So uh, I tried to accustom, I tried to accustom uh, the conductivity of sediments in such a way that the uh, measured heat flow, uh, it means product of new conductivity and observed gradient, uh, produce the same, the same heat flow as uh, that based on, on inversion results. So, it is shown. It is shown here. I I did two iterations in that procedure of accommodation thermal conductivity, uh, so that uh, to got uh, to get uh, this uh, uh, heat flow consistent with the inverse inverse problem, and I I got uh, such curves. For initial conductivity model, it is this curve. For first and second iteration of conductivity of sediments, it is this curve. So changes in conductivity in the uppermost 900 meters that were not involved in the inversion doesn't influence, do not influence shape of the history, but they, of course they influence the uh, steady state part, so they influence the niveau of, of, of the history. And how uh, oh, it was here, okay. So, I believe that this, this history shown here uh, represents not only the shape of the history but also the absolute value. So it means that uh, the, uh, value, the mean value of ground surface temperature, uh, at, let's say some glacial average uh, in this area of central Bohemia or northern Bohemia was slightly above zero. and 
the minimum during that uh, last glacial maximum was about minus 4, with rapid increase to some uh, nearly 12, 12 degrees, and then slow, slow decrease. The last 3,000 years were not uh, resolved by, by uh, data because our inverted profile, temperature profile, started at 900 meters only. So this is the comparison of measured temperature, red line, and the temper steady state temperature uh, based on results of our inversion and uh, our adaptation of uh, conductivity in sediments to the proper in inverted comma values. So my conclusions, ah, my conclusions are here. Uh, that ground surface temperature history of the last glacial cycle was reconstructed by inversion of a lower part of uh, our borehole uh, located in, in lowland of the northern Bohemia uh, under the assumption of a constant thermal conductivity of the homogeneous metamorphic rock below 900 meters the inversion provides glacial interglacial amplitude of some 15 to 16 kelvins the absolute value of the reconstructed ground surface temperature depends on a poorly known thermal conductivity of sedimentary cover. This uncertainty is, was estimated at 2 to 3 kelvins. The reconstructed uh, ground surface temperature history, when used as a forcing function in solving the transient heat conduction equation, yields current heat flow uh, lower by 25 to 30 milliwatts per square meter from the steady state in the uppermost 400 meters and the difference uh, from steady state is still about 10 milliwatts per square meter at one kilometer depth. So it seems that um, it is quite reasonable to assume that during this last glacial maximum uh, there was some occurrence of permafrost in central, in the, even in the lowland of central, central Europe. So that's all. Thank you.